Good morning, good evening, or midday, depending where you are. My name is Mika Videnius, creator of my Escuela Maria Debe, and today I want to talk about the curious case of the disappearing closed source databases. But uh, all good stories start from the beginning. In the beginning, the source code was free. That was big, uh, the source code usually come with big machines, computers, um, and uh, everything was freely available and people could learn by studying other people's code. But very soon, big corporations realized that we can make money on software and sell that independently from the hardware. There are lots of arguments why people should suddenly have to start paying for software. Because development of software costs money. And uh, without money, the companies will not survive so they can keep up the software, fix bugs and give support for it. And of course, one big argument that because when we not only want to uh, sell it, we also want to make it closed source so that people can study our code and try to steal our secrets. This did frustrate some people a lot, and especially Richard Stallman, who had been brought up in a community where all code is available, you can learn from other people, you can improve their code. So he started the GNU project in 1983 and very soon afterwards the Free Software Foundation. And uh, Richard Stallmans and lots of free software developers created a lot of infrastructure needed by developers to be able to develop free software. Comp compiler tools, uh, uh, administration tools. And uh, I remember that uh, in the old times when I used, were using Sun Solaris, Unix uh, derivata, uh, and the first things that you did when you got the Solaris machine is that you installed the GNU tools over it so you could get tools that were uh, had much better help, my functionality, functionality, and so on. But uh, even in '91, still there were some critical pieces missing. There were didn't exist a free operating system. The GNU people was trying to develop heard. Uh, the development started in 1990, but uh, it never really become popular or stable. And when Linux re was released in 1991. It basically become the very soon de facto standard free operating system. Of course, you had FreeBSD and everything else, but still Linux is the most popular one. But there was still a need for a database because uh, uh, when the internet started to become popular, people needed a way to store the data for the web apps. So let's uh, enter MySQL. I started development in 94. The first release was in 95. I got lots of comments from my friends uh, while doing the development that um, the, the world doesn't need another database. Why are you doing this? Uh, there's no way that you can compete with the big closed source companies who can earn so much more money than you, and especially your code is free, so how can you make any money? And how can companies trust that MySQL actually will survive uh, so that, uh, which is very critical for people who want to use it as the base for developing applications. What my friends hadn't taken it into account was the benefits of free software, especially when doing development. I still uh, did believe then, I still believe that doing free software and open source is a better way to develop software. And also, it was also a better way to spread the use of the product. But let's look back in, uh, in time and see how did it go with some of the, back then, very popular uh, databases. We have Ing uh, Informis, Ingress, Sybase, and others. Uh, if you were using some of the early versions of those, those has changed drastically, some of this doesn't exist, and you can't really get support for them anymore. So just being closed source really didn't help them. And if you look at uh, the most popular relational database in the world, Oracle, 
they still get make a lot of revenue, but they have stopped growing, especially when it comes to new users. Their uh, software license revenues are down uh, almost 2% over a year. I know that means for a long time. And uh, the only way that, or the main way that Oracle gets more and more money is that they have their existing customers pay more and more every year, even for the same database. So there's a lots of tricks that close database vendors do to get more money out of existing customers. They try to get you to pay for lots of different things. And even for smaller features, you still have to pay just to be able to uh, enable, enable them, like system version tables that comes by default in MariaDB. There's an, some tricks that I've heard from customers that wants to go away from closed source databases that uh, was kind of the reasoning why they wanted to do that. Not only the increased payment, but they have are forced to use old machines because they can't move the database to a new machine because they have it has more CPUs and suddenly the database would cost them much more without giving them any real benefits. And uh, I also heard about customers who got the uh, uh, commercial database for use for free for five, four or five years. And uh, they were then they believed that they would be able to extend that, but after they Grace period period was out. Suddenly, they got a big bill on the table and say, "No, you have to pay, or you just have to de-install all the instances of your database," which they couldn't do. And there are also people who have noticed that their contracts are such that even if they have thousands of database installations, which they are paying a lot of money for, and then they remove all of them except one. They still have to pay the full price. And some people have been felt that they have been tricked into signing the documents, which is one of the reasons that you always need to look closely what you're signing for. Because there can be some things that are not logical and not what you would expect. So, considering that your closed source database costs more every year without you getting any uh, benefits, is it the time to start to, to migrate something that is more open, more trustworthy? If you go and ask your current uh, closed source vendor, is this a good time to do? They will give you lots of reasons why you can't move, because it's so difficult, there is so big risk of doing that. And what happens if you lose data on the way? Because the migration process uh, uh, it's difficult and when you switch from one data with another one, you can lose something in between. Of course, you will never get proper support from the open source database. And there's lots of retraining to do and uh, uh, maybe we should just uh, take a seminar in Hawaii and discuss this and you can have all your DBAs and managers there so we can go to the new features in our product and see so you can understand why you have to pay more. It's your but uh, a lot of companies I meet when I'm traveling, this was before COVID and hopefully it will be the same when we can start traveling again, is that uh, uh, companies have started to be fed up with every year how to nego negotiate a new contracts with your existing vendors where you have to pay more and more, for, actually for less and less. So they are looking at open source because uh, if you are using an open source database, most of the things that you pay for goes away. In other words, no licensing, no CPU pricing, you only pay for support. And you usually have a 80 to 90 percent uh, benefits of lower prices, which actually is a good thing. And you have no lock-in, which means that uh, when you use an open source database, uh, uh, you can self-decide who will give you support and uh, where do you want to run it, on which kind of hardware in the cloud and so on. So we are in charge of your own destiny. You are not the vendor that tells you that you have to use this operating system and exactly this machine and so on. And you can even be part of 
developing the database for your future needs, uh, either by having your own developers do that or contact uh, the companies driving the project and tell them that you are prepared to fund uh, the features that you need in your next generation applications. But the question is how to do the migrations, because there's uh, lots of different ways to do that and lots of different steps that you have to follow. We're going to talk about how to migrate to, to MariaDB, but uh, similar rules apply to other databases. First, you should start with those applications that ha are using the standard feature set that, for the database that you want to move to. And of course, you start with the small ones that usually is very easy to migrate and can probably be done in a, a day or two, at least when it comes to the schemas and the data. And, uh, and if your applications are using a standard set um, connect connectors to, to connect to the database, like JDBC or ODBC, it's usually quite easy to move a database. And uh, you should first start with the applications for which you have the source code, which is quite uh, common in uh, lots of industries, that you actually have that. Because if there's a, something that small that you have to change, you can change it. Uh, and then the last one that you should consider migrating is those that uses some feature that is absolutely critical for you that doesn't exist in your database of choice to migrate. For example, MariaDB doesn't have materialized views. There's a ways to go around them, but uh, you probably have to do some applications or logic changes for that. But then the, the nice thing with MariaDB is that uh, you don't only can move your transactional database. You can also move your analytical database that may be in a different uh, closed source databases and use MariaDB for both because uh, the storage engine interface we have as part of MariaDB allows you to run different kinds of queries. One of the nice benefits of MariaDB is that we can emulate different uh, database constructs in different uh, uh, database languages. And uh, the best strategy when you want to move your database from one system to another one is that if you can manage to do that without having to do any changes in, in your application. And that's what we have been able to do with MariaDB with the Oracle emulation layer. So for with DBS Bank, we have been able to move 80% of their Oracle applications to MariaDB with basically or no change at all in either the application or in the store procedures. We are running them unchanged. And uh, the big benef biggest benefit of this is that the migration process is so much easier because uh, sometimes uh, it will take time to migrate from one database to another. But uh, uh, even if your database and application changes while you are doing the migration process, because uh, the, uh, the schemas and the store procedures are identical on MariaDB. It's very little work to keep the assumptions in sync. And uh, the regular layer we have created together with DBS can do most of the common Oracle syntax uh, changes. And all these uh, the extensions that we do will go into, into the open source versions of MariaDB. So, how the, does the migration then work in practice? Um, I like to recommend SQL Alliance, uh, which is an open source tool that you can run to uh, compare the compatibility of your application's uh, SQL code and, and also your database uh, store procedures between the, the database you are coming from and with MariaDB. And then you get a list of things that MariaDB doesn't support. And here you have the syntax of how to do that. And uh, when you have got the list of the syntax, uh, you go to, through it and then create a list of those things that is not supported in MariaDB. And when you have this list, then you will start to do the 
preparation for migration. And this is exactly how we do it with certain customers where that wants to work together with the Maria Ribi Corporation and the core Maria Ribi developers to do immigrations. So we, we, have, we are using Jira as uh, the way where we record bugs and feature requests. So we basically create a subtask in, in Jira for each customer. And then in the, under the subtask, they list all the functionality that they, they need. You can also do the subtask per application. And uh, when, we, when all the feature requests are listed, uh, MariaDB engineers will uh, go through them and then uh, do a specification for each of those and also create uh, um, a timetable for the whole application, how much development effort is needed. And um, when that's done, we go back to the customer who uh, work, work out uh, a time schedule and, uh, and price, and then we start developing on that. And um, during the development process, we take one task at a time, we uh, do it, we test it, and then we make a binary where the customer can then download directly and test and verify that this new features actually works as intended for their, for their applications. And when all subtasks is, is done, then we restart the real migrations of uh, the applications where we uh, where you start by creating a text file of your database schema, all your store procedures and everything else that goes into the database. You load it into MariaDB, and then you can use either the connect engine or whatever dump facility that you have to export the data into MariaDB. And then you just have to change the connectors to use uh, MariaDB, and then you can start test your application. And if something, when if something doesn't work, you report it in Jira, and, uh, 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 and then you either do that again, or uh, when you get a new binary to fix, that has fixed the issues that you found, or you set up a live replication between the original database and uh, MariaDB, so that you keep both databases in sync. And when things work, you just switch. So this is how we did things with, with the DBS bank. And as I said, they already moved more than 80% of the database to MariaDB with no change in, in applications. So there were, but there are lots of iterations where we were, went through the feature list that they needed and everything else. But the last couple of years, they haven't needed any new features and they've just been able to migrate, the, migrate easily to MariaDB. And uh, we also noticed that there have been no issues with performance in general. There were a couple of bugs where the, well, actually these features where the optimizer was not as good as Oracle in a few cases, which we uh, fixed during the uh, testing phase. And uh, DBS has been so happy to actually pay for more development of new things like the S3 engine that was added to MariaDB uh, 10.6. But one of the things that fascinated most me, me most with DBS was that they took the migration process of what to make this first, totally different to any other company that I ever met. So they uh, told me from the beginning that the first thing we want to uh, move is this, uh, our biggest, more, most complex database. We want to take that and move that first. And I tried to encourage them that should we try, try with something simple. Um, and they said, no, they want to do it this way because there is still people who don't believe that MariaDB actually can do this. But if you take this, our biggest, most hard to move, at least our belief application and get that to, to MariaDB, not the other database use it, use user can say that, oh, my application is so complex, we can't move it because we moved the hardest one. And that I think was quite smart of them because they got a lot of buy-in in the, in the, within the company where they managed to move the big one. And after that, things went internally quite quickly. 
And the other thing they did was that uh, when uh, we, they asked for a feature, we did it uh, um, and we gave them a bit binary. Basically, they tested it almost immediately, which was great for the MariaDB developers because if there's some bugs, you could have a very quick uh, feedback uh, test uh, fix uh, loop, which is much better for developers. So uh, most of the Oracle features was done in 10.3. We also added some uh, limited SQL Server syntax, but uh, there have also been some new things added in uh, 10.6, uh, Ronam and some functions, and this was done by Vokutech. And uh, I also expect that uh, for 10.7 and 10.8, we will add lots of more functionality because we have started to take migrations even more seriously than before and trying to work together with companies to uh, get a list of what they are missing so we can add those to MariaDB. So conclusions. Uh, I was at the start of the, the uh, DBS project. I was a uh, little bit worried about uh, how good will the performance be because Oracle is a really, really great database. They have optimized that for, for years and will the MariaDB's store procedures, will it be good enough for DBS? But we did know that, uh, notice that uh, uh, MariaDB is for their uses, uh, even if they have lots of store procedures, really performant, in many cases, even faster than Oracle. And uh, uh, one of the reasons is that even if MariaDB is really fa fast and performant by itself, uh, we got the additional benefit that Oracle did, didn't have, that we could run it on much newer hardware without any extra cost for DBS. So we got a nice performance boost there. And uh, I always thought that uh, it should, most databases or database applications actually use a very, very limited set of the database. And I think that uh, the, those migrations to be done within MariaDB has shown that this is indeed the case. I think that uh, of uh, all the databases data and database applications in the world, you can easily move 90% with uh, not too much work or cost to MariaDB. And uh, the there is 10% uh, of, the, of the applications. We are happy to let Oracle and others have that mark. So that's what I have to say. Hope that uh, you get inspired to move away from your costly closest database to some, something where you have more control, especially about your money. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so Monty, congratulations on a very, very interesting speech. I've seen your, uh, many of your speeches, but many of them are reruns in some version of something you've done before. This was a completely new one. How come? Well, I got inspired and it's just a new take of, of things. But uh, everything started actually with a party, uh, a wedding just a couple of days ago when I noticed that people don't understand why did even open source started. So I thought that that would be nice to have with the talk. Yeah, and then you managed to fit it into a, a talk about migration. So, so really a good one. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I'll start from one of the observations that touched me personally. So you, you were talking about when you started creating an open source database that your friends didn't believe in you. They told things like, what I told you, the world doesn't need another database. And I, I clearly remember having said that. So now you have your I told you so moment. Yeah, but uh, it was kind of fun. But the thing is that uh, back then I had customers, I, did, I did, had a community. So I saw that I was on the right track. The question was just can I actually fulfill the destiny. And it, it looks like I, I was able to do that. Yes, yes, you were, but but now, so I clearly remember me protesting and saying, 
that the world doesn't need another database. But um, your explanation of your reasoning, why you thought that the world did need another database, uh, that I cannot remember at all. So is that, is that something that you had as a hunch at that point in time, or was I just not uh, smart enough to understand your explanation of, of why you did it? It was basically, I had customers who needed it, I had, had needs, and I always have been customer friendly. So I tried to get, get uh, let them have everything they want. And they needed a database, so that kind of was it. And uh, with my MySQL, I created a community. I was active on the email list. There are lots of people who have needs. I tried to satisfy all of them. Well, That's why I was working so much. I ensured that every single email was answered. Which I do remember, but, but in your explanation, in your excellent presentation, you, you, you came with a top-level view that seemed uh, even smarter than that. So what you said was that, look, uh, open source or free software had created an editor and a compiler and all of that, but it hadn't created a data, uh, uh, an operating system prior to Linux, and it hadn't created a database properly uh, in your mind. Uh, so, so you were sort of answering a meta need, not just the need of your customers. So when did you arrive at that insight that actually you could fill a void that is not just a void for your customers, but for the world? Basically, after the first release of uh, MySQL, the internal release, and uh, we always, me and David Axmark, always wanted to give something back to the open source community, actually the free software community back then. And uh, MySQL was the first project that we thought was suitable for that, that had, uh, uh, there would be enough need for it. Yep. That, was that, project. That, that ended well, so that congratulations on that. So um, another thing that impressed me in your presentation, except for it being new and except for it describing things from many angles, was that it was a balanced view. So people who change the world usually are a bit fundamentalist. And at times you have had a fundamentalist views, but I think your, this speech did not contain any of that. You, you gave a good logical reasoning for why closed source was created, and you gave a good logical reasoning for, for why uh, databases were, were closed source. So uh, and I hope any explanation, is that just... Wisdom that wisdom that comes with age, or why were was your view here not so provocative, more more like a, a Solomonic view? I was trying more with the with the simple facts that the commercial databases they had stopped growing. The time is kind of out. The same thing with operating systems. So yeah, okay. I, I just following the the logic. So, so then moving on to, your, the, to the actual content, uh, you said that the open source world, the free software world, did not have a proper database. Uh, but I remember distinctly in the 90s that there were discussions about uh, Postgres versus MySQL, and, and, and Postgres was more or less of an incumbent. So there wasn't a void. So, so what's your comment on, on, on that? You didn't raise Postgres all that much in your presentation. Uh, because in the beginning, Postgres was not a relational database. It came uh, uh, many years after MySQL. They had their own language. They were not SQL and so on. OK. Uh, so then concretely on your uh, presentation, uh, where you mentioned DBS Bank. So. Lots of the viewers know what DBS Bank is, but others do not. So can you, can you briefly present, for those who do not know that DBS Bank is the biggest Asian IT bank, can, can you give, give a short uh, intro? Okay. So um, it's uh, based in Singapore. Uh, it's, um, as you said, the biggest bank, bank in uh, Asia, but they also are... I don't know how unique, but they have most of the software they have developed, they have developed themselves, which means that in theory, they should be able to switch to any database and um, because they could change the source. But the thing is that if you have, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of applications going through all those and modify those and do a migration, and you have to keep the a database uh, and application up to the sync with what you migrate to, that's a really, really 
tall order. And uh, uh, they believed in my vision of, uh, let's do it a different, uh, a different way. Let's do it that you don't have to do any changes to your application, and, or at least as little as possible. And uh, they believed that I could uh, do that uh, thanks to some of the decision makers had been using my skill for years. I didn't know about uh, my, my and my team's capabilities. And that's kind of the, the start of the discussion. And we were able to do the first version of uh, MySQL with Oracle compatibility uh, running in, in within half a year with a team of only two, three people. MariaDB, not MySQL. Yeah, MariaDB, yes. No. So um, there was a, a percentage that you mentioned there, 80% done and 20% not. I thought it was more than 80%, but, but that do the 20% contain those applications that are not coded by, uh, by DBS Bank themselves, so the way you do not have access to the source code, or can you comment on the 80-20? Uh, the 80% was uh, something said one year before COVID, I haven't got the new one, but I, as far as I know, they are trying to convert everything. I mean, but if you have thousands of applications, it takes time. So, I, 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 so so far, they haven't uh, contacted me about a single application that would be hard to move. And uh, what's your comment on, on moving applications where you do not have access to the source code, so the, the, the not house internal ones? Have they migrated any of those? I don't know. I think they have migrated even some of those. And then the, the fact, as long as you can go and change the driver, you don't need to have uh, the access to the source code. And that's the whole idea with the compatible layer. Compatibility mm -hmm. layer, <laughs> sorry. So, so you had some scary stories there about how much you can be forced to pay to a closed source provider and what the conditions are. Like first you pay nothing and then suddenly you pay a lot. And you had one comment there about, well, as long as you have one single instance of the closed source database running, you need to pay for all. But that, I mean, it wouldn't make sense then to convert 80% that remain uh, and have some 20% remaining if, if you still have to pay everything. So that's, uh, that seems to be an exception and not the rule. And no, this is something that uh, some of the vendors have in their latest contract. And this is the way that they try to ensure that people wouldn't do uh, or, or move on their databases. So this is a trap. And that's why I had the last... Uh, sentence uh, in uh, my presentation on that page. You shouldn't something you that you don't, uh, yeah. But uh, the thing is that uh, uh, you have a choice. Do you want to be uh, uh, with that database forever and be totally uh, uh, in their power that they can just go and raise your uh, cost 10 times and you can do nothing? So the thing is that just the fact that they're doing the things like this, I think it's the best reason that you should try to start moving immediately to eventually get rid of it. Yeah, what, what, so Monty, what is uh, limiting the speed of, with which this uh, migration is happening? Why, why it's, it's like a no-brainer, everybody should do it, so why isn't it happening even faster than it is? I think the biggest reason is that DBS is comfortable with uh, what they know and what they have used for years. So there's a resistance of change uh, within the companies. And uh, um, sometimes the DBAs are not aware or don't care about the money savings that the company could do. So for um, migrations to actually happen, uh, for large scales within organizations, it has come from the top. But there's lots of companies who have decided that we shouldn't use certain databases. Like HP did years ago a decision that we will never use a closed source database again, and so on. And uh, we need more of that happening. But the thing is that I think DBAs could show that they are more valuable for the companies by taking in, in, in initiatives and trying to do migration themselves just to prove that it works. Because people are afraid that will it work or not? And that's why I think that the DBS bank was so smart of first moving their biggest, hardest uh, uh, application that everybody said that impossible to move. 
to start moving that. Because after that, the DBAs had no arguments anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, if I understand your algorithm or your process correctly of how you suggest that uh, organizations migrate to off or closed source databases to MariaDB, it is that they uh, do not uh, do any porting of the application code at all. All the changes are in MariaDB server itself. And, and the other item here is that most of that work was already done by uh, DBS Bank. So, so the usual suspects, the usual things needed when uh, wanting to run uh, uh, Oracle code in, in MariaDB, they're already done. And now it should converge even quicker. So is that, two questions. Is that a correctly understood model? And uh, can you elaborate in any way on that? Yeah, the model is correct. Uh, I think that uh, it's possible to that you change your applications and people who are just in a hurry can do that. But if you have uh, hundreds of applications, it's much smarter to minimize the changes because that also allows you to do changes in the ori original application before you have moved and you don't have to do anything on the, on the other side. And looking at where we are with the compatibility layer is that most applications should move, but uh, Oracle is a great database with lots of different options and lots of different ways to do things. So some things will be missing. And if there, there's missing things, then you have two choices. You change those partner applications that use in those, or you come to MariaDB Corporation and uh, ask uh, us, uh, give us a quote for fixing this. And uh, my view and hope is that we will get more and more migrations uh, done uh, by changing the server, which will help everybody to get their future migrations easier, easier over time. So that's a great view. Is that your, are those your concluding view, words about the curious case of the disappearing closed source database? Or, or, or and do you have anything to add? I should say you should start moving now as long as you still can afford to pay for your closed source database and go to something that is free and you are in charge of your own destiny. Thank you, Monty. Great answers. Okay, thank you. Thank you.